Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, a quick update on the travel ban and DACA. Then, ice capades. Immigration and customs enforcement has never gotten so much press. A reporter on the beat will tell us why it's deserved. Radical women at the Brooklyn Museum. And teaching underprivileged kids to swim. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Ashley Ford, here with my producer, Ross Tuttle. Hey, good afternoon. How you doing? Good afternoon. We've got a <laughs> packed show today. At the top, we'll talk about a trio of ways Trump is trying to homogenize America, make it whiter, safer, safer for white people, uh, fulfill his promise to make Point it me. great again, again, for white people, mostly men. Congratulations, Ross. I'm talking about the travel ban in the Supreme Court yesterday, the DACA repeal. Don't forget the cancellation, Ashley, of the temporary protected status of, for El Salvador, Haiti. Uh, up next, perhaps, the 9,000 Nepalese who came here after the earthquake a few years back. Um, they're evaluating that TPS, and those guys are brown. They'll likely get the boot as well. Sounds like it. And ICE enforcement. Arrests at courthouses at an all-time high, warrantless raids, Cuomo threatening to sue. Ryan Devereaux from The Intercept will break that down for us. Then a new exhibition at Brooklyn Museum that spotlights, that spotlights the work of Latin American and Latino women. Plus, we'll meet someone who's helping underprivileged kids stay afloat, literally. But to start us off, we've got Albert Kahn, legal director at the Council on American Islamic Relations, to talk about the travel ban and DACA. He's joining us over the phone. Albert, are you there? I am, and thank you for having me again. So happy to have you back, um, Thanks, even Albert. though the things that we talk about are sometimes uh, a little more depressing than anything else. But can I'm we sure. talk first briefly about the travel ban and what happened Wednesday in the Supreme Court? Yeah, Wednesday was really a momentous day. We saw the culmination of months of litigation as these cases have gone from the district court to the appellate courts, and now finally the highest court in the land ruling, hearing arguments whether President Trump's Muslim ban, to be exact, his third version of a Muslim ban, is constitutional, and whether it violates federal immigration law. And so the arguments, you know, while we're talking about a single ban, the justices were actually trying to wrestle with a bunch of different issues. You know, it, part of it was whether the uh, Congress prohibited the president from having this sort of ban based off of nationality. And the government was arguing that just the opposite, rather than prohibiting this sort of discrimination, Congress wanted the president to have exactly this sort of power. But beyond the questions of our federal statutes, there's a question of our Constitution and whether this sort of power is a violation of the First Amendment. And we at CARE believe that it is, because it is this sort of religious discrimination that our founding fathers sought to prevent by having a First Amendment that prevents the government from establishing or favoring any one faith over another. And, and Albert, I mean, they have this—their uh, argument is a, the, a thin veil, this saying about it, that it's about national security, right? And the question, I, I guess, that came up before the Supreme Court was whether the court had the right or the jurisdiction to rule on issues of national security when that is supposed to be the purview of the executive branch. And it seemed to be—that seemed to be the focal point, uh, particularly for, for Justice Kennedy. Did you get that sense from your, uh, your viewing? of the proceedings? Yeah, there's a big question about how much deference the court should give the executive when they're making decisions on the basis of national security. Uh, of course, this isn't a new argument. If we look back at the disgraceful Korematsu decision from World War II, in that case, the president at the time, FDR, said just the same thing, that the court needed to defer to the executive to make national security decisions, and in that case, imprison over 120,000 Americans of Japanese descent, the majority of whom were U.S. citizens. In this case, it's just as clear that the court has a role in examining the national security justification put forward by the president, because if the court can't play that role in a situation like this, where we've gone over 400 days 
with this ban in place. It's not an overnight emergency. This is a lengthy process. If the court can't examine national security in a case like this, then it never can examine national security questions, and we've effectively abandoned its role under our Constitution. And, they, Albert, and then the administration can do anything in the name of national security. Sorry, Ashley, you had a question. That's okay. Albert, I actually wanted to ask if people um, are right and people are predicting that the Supreme Court will ultimately uphold the ban, what could be some of the short-term or long-term effects of something like that? Well, I want to make clear that there is a long history of people far smarter than me making predictions about the court that proved to be completely wrong. Right. You only have to look back to the Obamacare oral arguments a few years ago to see all the pundits saying that the Affordable Care Act would be struck down and just a few months later having egg on their face. Yep. So That's I true. don't think we can know at this point how the justices will rule. But that being said, if they do uphold the Muslim ban, there's still a role for Congress in, uh, in making it clearer that this sort of ban is unlawful. And there's a role for the electorate in voicing their opinion about the legality and constitutionality of this sort of anti-Muslim executive order. That's, that's important to keep in mind. Can we shift gears real quick? We have very little time left, but just talk about DACA, because there was a decision this week in federal court um, where the federal court said the administration hadn't made its case adequately that DACA was unconstitutional, but that they have 90 days to make their case again. Can they make that case, do you think? So in this case, the court had previously said that the administration had to keep, uh, that they still had to uphold DACA protections. But this could go even further and force the administration to start accepting new DACA applications. Right. And that's a crucial development. And here the court pointed out that on the basis of the documents put forward so far, they, the decision to end DACA is arbitrary and capricious, that it was without a legal justification. I do not believe when that 90-day period is over and when the, the administration has submitted its argument that there will be any, any logical basis for ending DACA. And so I'm quite hopeful that the court will keep DACA uh, protections and renew DACA applications going forward. Well, Albert, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Anytime you can come on here and share some of your expertise with us. Well, thank you again for having me, and hopefully next time it won't be something quite as depressing. But Let's hope. We'll Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, thanks, Fingers Albert. Crossed. Take care. Bye. Stay tuned for our next conversation. Arrests or attempted arrests by ICE in New York state courts rose last year by 1,200 percent, and New York City saw the bulk of that enforcement. Governor Cuomo just said the state would sue ICE for the warrantless raids they're conducting elsewhere, like one that just happened at an upstate dairy farm. Our next guest has written extensively about an unleashed ICE for The Intercept, and he has an article coming out today that talks about new tactics here in New York City. Welcome Ryan Devereaux to 112BK. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Can you just start by talking to me, you know, ICE ICE's enforcement is up across the board, right? That's correct. Can you give me some examples of how that's played out specifically here in Brooklyn, maybe? Yeah, I mean, but, but the first the first thing to understand about what ICE is doing right now is that uh, at the beginning of the Trump administration, the, the president signed a couple of executive orders that eliminated Obama era sort of priorities on who's a target for enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, which means uh, that now. Basically, everyone who's undocumented in the country is a target, right? The, right. There's, no, there's no sort of difference. In New York City, in Brooklyn, that means, you know, at, at the, the, the city has tried to posture itself as a sanctuary city, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning it's not turning people over to ICE in jail. So what ICE right. is doing instead is going to people's homes, it's going to court, they're going to courts, and they're yeah. sweeping up everybody where they, wherever they can find them. And they're trying a lot of different tactics to find, you know, sort of everybody on their radar. And while the administration would like us to think that, uh, you know, we're all talking about bad hombres here, mm -hmm. a lot of the folks that they're picking up are people who have been here for years and years, who have long-standing ties in the community, um, people who wouldn't have been a target two or three years ago are now finding themselves 
picked up, uh, moved into detention centers across the country right. and moved out of the country eventually. Now, the article that you have coming out today in, you know, just probably mere minutes yeah. uh, is about some of those tactics. Can you talk to me about what you learned, some of the details? Yeah, so one, what we have learned is that in recent weeks, uh, ICE has begun sending out letters to folks who, um, shortly after encounters with the NYPD. Mm encouraging them to come to their office in Manhattan. Uh, the letters are really vague, but they are a letter from a federal law enforcement agency, so they show up, they tell people, you know, the letters show up, they're urging people to come in. People get these letters and they're not sure what to, to do. They're faced with a sort of dilemma. Do I ignore this right. and risk the possibility that they're gonna come to my home, um, where I have my family, my right. kids, pick me up on, you know, drive my kids to school, pick me up at work. Right. Or do I go in and, you know, Try risk the possibility that they're just going to grab me as soon as I get in there? In a couple of the cases that we've looked at, that's exactly what's happened. Mm. People have gone in thinking uh, that they're going to have a conversation, and they're detained on the spot. Uh, we have a case where a woman uh, was in the process of getting her green card. She's married to a US, U.S. citizen. And she decided to go in for this meeting, and they arrested her right there. She's been in detention for about a month and a half now and is facing deportation. Um, you know, ICE will sp say that it's doing these sorts of things because it doesn't have access to jails to, to get people the way that it used to. They'll say that this is a result of sanctuary cities. The de Blasio administration here in New York will say, we're doing everything that we can to protect undocumented folks here, especially folks who, you know, whose only violation is an immigration violation or a low-level right. misdemeanor or something like that. The problem with that is that as soon as you have an encounter with the NYPD that results in an arrest, even if it's for, for a low-level arrest, mm -hmm. if your fingerprints get rolled, which happens in the case of most arrests that the NYPD does, right. Those fingerprints get sent to an agency upstate in Albany, and they get sent from there to the FBI. Once those fingerprints are sent to the FBI, they enter a vast sort of pool of federal law enforcement databases that ICE has right. access to. So while the City Hall would like to say that they're doing everything they can, the very structure of the way that our law enforcement agencies interact, right. especially post 9-11, sort of guarantees that once you have an encounter, your information is in there and in that system and available. Right. So it's it's really hard to protect it in you know sort of on all fronts the the sort of vulnerabilities that undocumented folks That's face. What it sounds like. And how is De Blasio reacting to tactics like this letter? Well, so we have we have had communication with City Hall, and they are looking into this. Uh, mm -hmm. They had only recently learned that these letters are going out. Um, they're talking to their sort of contacts in the immigrant community here in the city, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, but like I said, there there are sort of limitations as to what a, a municipal government can do, just given the way that law enforcement shares right. information these days. And you know, we have to keep in mind that the bread and butter of what the NYPD has done in New York City for years is quality of life enforcement. It's broken mm -hmm. windows policing. Right. So the ways in which you can come to have an interaction with the police department in New York City are numerous. And for somebody who's undocumented, I mean, that can have really serious consequences. I like that you say that because so many people, when they hear a story like this, their thought would be, well, just don't have an interaction with the NYPD. Right. Just don't have an interaction with the police and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a black woman in the world, how likely it is that I could end up having an interaction with NYPD, whether I've done something wrong or not. Yeah. It seem, it's incredibly likely, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, with law enforcement in general. I mean, you know, we have a different mayor now and a different police chief, and that makes some amount of difference, but let's not forget that this is a city where, just a few years ago, we had stop and frisk numbers that were absolutely through the roof. I absolutely. covered that trial, um, you know, day in and day out. And the NYPD, like a lot of big city police departments, you know, they can come up with a reason to stop you or not come up with a reason to stop you. Right. And any day of the week. I mean, the things that you can get stopped for that can result in, in, in a stop are, are just, it's an endless list. Absolutely. So, you, you know, for somebody who is undocumented, you are entering a, a world in which, like, the risk is 
constant, right? right? And any slip up, or you don't even really need a slip up, you just need to be out there. Mm -hmm. Something can to happen. Be out in the world. And if your fingerprints get taken, you know, that unfortunately can be the first step on the road to deportation. Thank you so much, Ryan, for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. To hear the full conversation, please tune into the podcast. Radical Women is a new Brooklyn Museum exhibit that highlights the contributions of women artists spanning Latin America and the U.S. during a period of political and social upheaval. With works in a variety of media—photography, video, conceptual art, poetry, performance art, and other experimental forms—the exhibition looks at artists' personal interpretations of the fight for representation and freedom of expression, and to disrupt the status quo. Recently, I sat down with two Brooklyn Museum curators who were instrumental in bringing the show to its only stop on the East Coast, Catherine Morris, senior curator at the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art, and Carmen Ermo, assistant curator. Here's that conversation. Catherine and Carmen, thank you both so much for being here today. I really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. Talk to me about this exhibit. How did it first come about, Carmen? I'll turn that one to Catherine. Tell me, Catherine, <laughs> how did it first come about? Well, I'm the senior curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for mm -hmm. Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And in the nine years I've been there, I've been aware of this exhibition in the making that two amazing curators, our colleagues, um, Cecilia Ferrado Hill and Andrea Gunta, have been working on for years, mm -hmm. and I wanted it. Yeah. And um, when The Hammer in L.A. decided to take it on, we got really excited and we're just thrilled to be able to be the only East Coast venue for this ex really important exhibition. It sounds really important, to be perfectly honest. I know so often when people talk about Latino women in art, the first thing they think of is who? Frida Kahlo. And that is often where that knowledge begins and ends. So true. Yes. yes. So is this like an active attempt by Brooklyn Museum to combat that sort of, to be perfectly honest, it's an, it's an ignorance of access. People just usually don't have access to the information, nor do they see it places. Yeah, I mean, we are so fortunate to be the platform for the work that Andrea and Cecilia have been doing for eight years, actually. Right. So an exhibition of this size that has 123 artists, the Brooklyn Museum, almost 300 artworks, 15 different countries represented, including Latinas working in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, it really sort of sets the stage for a complete immersion in exactly what you're saying, Ashley, something that people might not know, or actually that people really should know. Um, yeah. And by people, we mean not just our visitors, um, but also curators like us, art historians, the art world, period. And so there are definitely known names, um, like artists like Ana Mendieta, right. Marta Minujin, um, but then there's just such a wealth of um, vastly diverse types of work from artists that you thought you know oh, and you're absolutely. learning something new about, and also artists who have really never been shown like this in New York. So absolutely. many artists that have never been shown. How are art historians and other artists responding to the works? People really understand the groundbreaking work that this show represents, and they really understand that they're walking into an exhibition where they're going to see names they don't know, mm -hmm. and they're going to learn something rather than just having their common knowledge reinforced. And they're going to walk out understanding that if they are going to do work in this subject in the future, they have to think about this show, and this show has to have an impact like on that. the next show that <laughs> comes up about Latin American art, and that's what we want to do. I like that. Or the next show that comes up about conceptual art. Or, or the conceptual. next show that comes up about performance art. I mean, there's right. so many avenues. Yeah, exactly. Film. There's amazing film in this exhibition. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm ready for that, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, because I've heard a little bit about this already. I don't want to brag, but I've heard a little bit, <laughs> yes. and I'm actually really excited to see it. Carmen, can you tell me, because this isn't a debut, this is um, an exhibition that has gone um, to other museums. Uh, it was at the Hammer mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Is there something or anything Brooklyn-specific about it now that it's in Brooklyn? Absolutely. First and foremost, if you know the Brooklyn Museum, our public programs team is amazing, so mm -hmm. they always activate. We have a whole film series. Every Thursday night in July are going to be performances by younger emerging artists responding to the themes. But in terms of the exhibition itself, we added a few more artists. Um, we wanted to 
have a, a kind of deeper resonance with communities in New York. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we added the work of Dr. Marta Moreno Vega, one of the founders of El Museo del Barrio and the Caribbean Cultural Center Africa Diaspora Institute, um, with a fabulous self-portrait that's right in the first section that you walk in. Great piece. We added more photos by Sophie Rivera, who was an artist working in New York, mm -hmm. um, who is an artist, and um, those photographs also completely change the tenor of that section, um, looking at social places and artists and their relationships to community. So to, to bring an artist who's talking about New York, who's talking about New Yorkans and their experience mm -hmm. here, um, really, you know, we wanted to, to make connections to artists making work in New York. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Catherine, one of the things that really strikes me about the Brooklyn Museum, and you know, this is, this will be um, next month my fourth year living here. Um, and I've always lived within walking distance of the Brooklyn Museum, which means that I've always gone to the Brooklyn Museum. And I've noticed that when it comes to representation in exhibition, you all have always done a really, really fabulous job. It's where I see some of the most um, radical forward representation of different kinds of artists from all sorts of different backgrounds. Can you tell me why is it so important to you guys to have that kind of representation in the museum and not just in terms of art but in terms of artists? Because we need to change the canon. Mm. Because art history, as most of us were taught it or lived it, is not a singular story. There are so many stories that need to enrich so many lives, and that's where the excitement lies in doing what we do today. Mm -hmm. This is the second, um, I'm really proud of the fact this is the second show in a row that has the word radical women yes. in the title um, in the Sackler Center. Right. We started with We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985, and now we have Latin American Radical Women. What's also really interesting to me about that point is that um, the word feminist is not in either of those titles, right. but the work is about feminism and is understood in relationship to feminism, but it's also a complicated story, and that's part of the complicated history we want to acknowledge and talk about. Right. In the minute and a half we have left, I have to ask you, Carmen, this is really interesting to me because one of my favorite exhibits at the museum is the dinner party, and this really hugs the dinner party, <laughs> mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. Was that intentional? The dinner party is always at the heart of Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist mm -hmm. Art, Judy Chicago's great masterwork, and it can be a really interesting tension. For this exhibition, for the We Wanted a Revolution exhibition, mm -hmm. the dinner party happened from 1979 to 1970. 1974 to 1979, so it overlaps with both of those exhibitions, and yes. it's, in a lot of regards, it, it helps us question the differences between a more mainstream feminist art, if you will, that mm -hmm. nonetheless was groundbreaking and was often not accepted by the art world, period, but then with We Want to Revolution, that networks of black artists who were specifically left out mm -hmm. and erased or mm -hmm. avoided by the white art community versus something like this Latin American art show, right. which is the same period, and, and mm -hmm. just questioning different approaches to feminism, to feminism art um, and to approaching the lives of women, the realities of women artists. There are just so many different ways to approach. I really love that. I love that so much and it's something that I'm, I'm really excited to see when I go see the exhibit. So for other people who are tuning in, listening, watching, how do they come see the show? Get on the subway, except on the weekend. Get on the subway, <laughs> except on the weekend. Sit tight, it'll get you there. How long will it be running? Runs through July 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, our upcoming first Saturday in May, May 5th, will be dedicated to Radical Women, so a day full of programmings Great. about the show. And um, a lot of people don't know that we are open until 10 p.m. on Thursday nights. I did. Um, always pay what you wish, and so you can come in, experience the show, a little more chill on Thursday nights, and we have a lot of films and, and performances happening. Um, so that's a good moment to visit, but it's always a good moment to visit the Brooklyn always Museum. Always a good moment to visit the Brooklyn <laughs> Museum. Thank you both so much yeah, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Summer is around the corner, and if you can find a body of water bigger than a puddle in this city, that means swimming. But that raises questions of safety, because drowning is the second leading cause of accidental death among children ages 1 to 14. And in families with household income below $50,000 a year, 79% of children have no or low swimming ability.
To address this, Asphalt Green has a program called Waterproofing, which provides free swim instruction for kids in New York City public schools. To tell us about it and a kickoff event this Saturday, we welcome David Ludwig, Community Programs Director at Asphalt Green. Thanks for coming on 112BK, David. Hi, thanks for having me. Talk to me a little bit about Asphalt Green. What's you guys' mission? Sure, so Asphalt Green is a wonderful and unique nonprofit, and our mission is to help all New Yorkers achieve health through sports and fitness. Which sounds amazing to me. How does waterproofing fit into that? So waterproofing gives 2,600 kids this year a chance to learn to swim, and it's all through the public schools. This year we have 47 public schools, two of them right here in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, learning how to swim. The kids come once a week to one of five locations, and they get a group swim lesson during the school day as a class. It's a, just a great experience for them. I have a quick question, mm -hmm. just because it's something that's on my mind. If adult person, adult mm -hmm. Brooklynite, mm -hmm. we'll just call them adult Brooklynite, mm -hmm. wants to uh, learn how to swim maybe mm -hmm. as well. Are there programs through Asphalt Green to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, our Battery Park City campus is not too far from Brooklyn. It's easy to get to, and you mm -hmm. can come in and, and take lessons there or on the Upper East Side, too, if you want to get out of your neighborhood a little right. and check out a different part of the city. We have uh, lessons, and we're always surprised. Uh, there's you know, plenty of adults out there who think, oh, I can't, it's too late for me, you know, I can't learn, and then they come right. and they feel um, so accomplished when they do pick up the skill. It's a life skill that everyone should have. Absolutely, mm -hmm. very much so, I'm yeah. into it. How long have you been running this program? So I, I've been at Asphalt Green for 10 years, but we started in 1994 when we built our aqua center on the Upper East Side, mm -hmm. and um, that we have a, a Olympic-sized pool, and we just figured, hey, this is a great uh, time of day during the middle of the school day, let's get these kids in here from Harlem and from surrounding schools. Wow. And we've been doing it ever since. So did waterproofing also start then? Or? Yeah, that's what yeah, that's what we uh, the name we came up with. Yeah. Fantastic. I love it. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to assess the impact of the waterproof program so far? Yeah, well we we just keep track of what skills the um, kids pick up over the course of the year. They come mm -hmm. once a week over the they get about thirty lessons more or less. Mm -hmm. And all the kids pick up those kind of core safety skills, you know, how to be safe in the water, floating, getting themselves to the side yeah. of the pool, and and um, a lot of them really become confident deep water swimmers by the end. So That's a lot of yeah. lessons, and yeah. it's consistent, yeah. which, you know, so mm -hmm. many kids, they don't get the consistency. They might have mm -hmm. opportunity to be in a pool or in a lake mm -hmm. or something like that once, but, mm -hmm. you know, not consistent. So you yeah. guys have figured out how to bridge that gap, which is amazing. Can you talk to me about the Big Swim Kick event? Yeah, so this is our 23rd annual Big Swim Big Kick. It's this Saturday. You can still register. It's for kids ages 6 to 10, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful day. It's basically a swim meet, and the kids get to get up on the blocks or next to the blocks mm -hmm. and hear that uh, uh, gun go off and uh, jump in the water and, and race and get an official time. And we will have Olympians that, there that you can meet, and it's just a fun event. And then soccer is also really big at Asphalt Green. Right. And so we have this whole uh, side on our field on the Upper East Side of uh, like a soccer carnival where you can do different kind of activities. It's all free. You can go on our website and register, or you can show up and, and register on site. It's going to be a wonderful day. What's the website, real quick? Asphaltgreen.org. Asphaltgreen.org. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yep. And that's the show. Have a great weekend. We'll be back next week with public advocate Letitia James, a documentary about the notorious Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Brooklyn weddings, food justice, and more. Hope you can join us.